things that journalists don't care about, but these are the type of things fans seem to care about. And uh, if at the end of this hour or so, I can take you back to the sight, sounds, and smells of Smart Studio circa 1990 and let you into kind of how we worked and the sort of magic that was made and how um, basically in 46 days we made an album which changed our life and set us on the path to superstardom. So let's jump in. A little context first. Uh, our first album was produced with uh, Butch Vig, the great producer. But at the time we met Butch, um, somewhere in late 1989 or 1990, Butch was a relatively unknown producer. He had recently worked with Nirvana on some songs that I think just eventually just became demos. I think they might have been the early demos for um, what became Nevermind. We, um, we had managed to land a uh, single with Sub Pop, just two songs. And so we chose Butch as our producer, although we didn't know him. So somewhere in 1990, I guess early 1990, uh, we drove up to Madison, Wisconsin, which was where Smart Studios, the building's still there, right about a mile away from the Capitol building on sort of the main drag that takes you into town. Uh, Madison, uh, Wisconsin being about two and a half hours drive from, sh from Chicago, which to us was <laughs> could have been 200,000 miles because uh, anywhere outside the city was far to us. We were poor. And, um, and on that day, and I'm taking you before Gish now to give you some context, the first day we ever met Butch Vig, Vig we pulled up in the, the silver van that we had, which was constantly falling apart, which I think we bought for about $1,000. And we unloaded our gear there on the on the step, and and later that day we recorded two songs with Butch, um, La Dali Vida and Tristessa. Tristessa being our second single, I Am One being our first. So we knew Butch, and so when we got signed to Caroline Records, which at the time was a major independent affiliated with Virgin, our contract stating that if they wanted to keep us after the first record, they could drop us at any time. So it wasn't a guaranteed contract. But if they wanted us to keep us for a second record, since they were going to put out Caroline, we would get booted up to uh, Virgin Records. And Gish, the record we're about to talk about tonight, was so successful that they actually tried to boot us up at the end of the Gish cycle to re-release Gish on uh, the major label of Virgin, of which I refused, which is a story you'll have to read in the book someday. Sorry, talking too fast. It's hard to go back sometimes. Because I want, I really do want to take you there, so I hope you do it faithfully. So yeah, so um, yeah, somewhere there in early 1990, we recorded those two songs with Butch. Got on well. We're very happy, although the songs went really fast. I think we recorded in essentially two days. We drove up, recorded that day, stayed the night in a motel, recorded the next day, got back in the van and drove back. And the next time we actually saw Butch in, Butch in the flesh, we were uh, starting uh, what was Gish. We had a budget, which at the time was twenty thousand dollars which um, given the circumstances, I think would have afforded us somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, 20 or so recording days, which at that point was pretty standard. I think obviously it's skewed now because recording with digital, um, but you know, that was, that was considered a luxury, you know, a couple and a half weeks to record an album. Most bands, uh, indie bands at the time made pretty basic records. Uh, I wanted to make something more ambitious, but certainly um, knew we didn't, you know, we couldn't afford to be, couldn't afford to be overly indulgent. So, um, but some context before I jump into the songs, because I think it does, it will, it, it, it's something I don't want to say over and over again, so I'm sort of give this as a song context. Um, I found it really difficult in the early days of the band to write songs, which seems strange now because I can't crank them out fast enough. But to give you some context, uh, I Am One, our first single, which I believe was released in 1989 on the Limited Potential label, a local Chicago independent. That's the first song we're going to talk about. So if you can, if you can understand the context, Basically, a year plus later, a year and a half later, I still hadn't written a better opener, opening song for the record. And we made the decision to re-record the I Am One song uh, with Butch. Um, and, that, and I'm not sure I, I knew that was going to be the first song. Um, if, in my mind, it was always going to be between the first two songs, I Am One and Shiva. But we'll get to Shiva in a second. Um, so we made the decision. Um, Butch didn't have any particular input on the material. He just expected us to show up and be ready. Uh, the understanding was we were going to record about 10 songs, which we did, sort of. And, um, and, and uh, we talked about it, um, particularly Jimmy and I, and we made the decision to re-record not only I Am One, but also Tristessa. And again, I think the reason I'm saying this is it shows you it was very difficult for the band to come up with what I considered at the time to be original material. Um, riffs weren't easy to come by. 
um, the, the, the ideas didn't necessarily flow. And it sort of shocks me at the time, shocks, shocks me now looking back, that we didn't have more choices, we didn't have a greater width. In many ways, we walked in off the street that day in, in, in late 1990 to begin recording uh, Gish um, without a lot of material and basically the best of what was our live set at the time. Um, as some of you who follow other social media accounts, you'll see some of the gigs we were playing, Avalon Nightclub, some gigs at Cabaret Metro. So we were doing a lot of jamming. We weren't necessarily sure how that was going to factor into the record. I believe we were already playing early sketches of songs that ultimately became Rocket and Silverfuck and Sign Me Stream, but we didn't feel those were ready. So to set the context, we walk into uh, you know, our first uh, real record. We've got uh, two, three guitars, four if you count my acoustic, uh, Ovation Acoustic, uh, two Stratocasters, James's Black Les Paul, and I can't remember what bass we used at the time, and Jimmy's drum kit. We had only, William well, brought up one guitar amp and one bass amp. That's all the equipment we had. We had no synthesizers, we had no nothing. And so that's the, that's the band that came into Smart Studios that day in the late 1990 to, be re to begin recording. Um, so obviously, I'm going to talk about stuff in a way that we didn't record them this way, but more to the mindset of what we were thinking when we were recording them. So obviously, I Am One was, at that time, one of our most important songs. And again, we made the decision to re-record the song, which is pretty curious on the face of it, because although I like the song, I wouldn't consider it a great, great song, um, although it's sort of interesting. Um, lyrically, not a lot going on there. Uh, basically sort of a riff on religion, and uh, if anybody knows religion, the triune, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, hence the, the, the notion that I am one as you are three. And uh, really more of kind of a kind of a rocking, riffing jam. And what's even more curious is, you know, because we'd recorded the song essentially over a year before, when we went to re-record it, we didn't change the arrangement at all. Like we hadn't even, <laughs> we didn't even spend a single moment that I can remember other than time we spent on stage. So all we did was to set up to record a better version of a song we had a year and a half or so to a year to improve, which is pretty strange to me. Um, uh, as I may have said along the way, I'm sure I'm going to repeat some things for some of you. Um, the, the original riff, the, 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 the thing that starts the, the Gish album, is actually a drum riff that I wrote. Don't ask me how I came up with it. It was one of those things just occurred to me one day, and I asked Jimmy to, to play the riff, uh, which he plays beautifully. And, um, and, uh, and uh, the riff and the whole thing was written around just that drum riff. Um, I just love the sound of that. Um, probably somewhat influenced by the drumming style of uh, Stephen Perkins of Jane's Addiction, who played this kind of beautiful, kind of jungly type of grooves. But I'm um, also probably, you know, Led Zeppelin as well. Um, sorry, I was going to make a point about uh, equipment. Uh, oh, right. So um, to give you the context of Smart Studios, which was Butch's studio that he owned uh, with a couple guys that were um, in... Uh, one guy that was in a band with him, for a previous band, uh, called Firetown. Um, and there's another band that they were in this, Names Escapes Me. And uh, another guy, Steve Marker. Um, so and eventually, if anybody knows Garbage, Butch was the drummer in Garbage, and the two guys in guitars. Those were the owners of Smart Studios. Uh, Butch and, and, and the other guy whose name escapes me, I'm so sorry. Um, lovely guy. Uh in fact, he's the one who lent us the acoustic guitar that, that I played later on the record, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so very much a homespun local studio uh, built for, uh, you know, independent bands. They, as far as I understand it, put all the sheetrock up. So it was a very rough studio. It wasn't like super pro or anything. The walls were at all kind of really strange angles, uh, industrial carpeting on the floor. And if anybody knows equipment, which had a tack scorpion board, which is a totally entry level mixing council. Not horrible sounding, but certainly not professional fidelity. The record was basically made on this tack scorpion board, um, which shocks me. Um, Butch had one piece of outboard gear, which most of the uh, guitars were run through in the bass and the vocals. So we all ran almost everything outboard outside of probably the snare drum, uh, guitars, bass, and vocal through this one uh, preamp, if anybody knows, uh, recording equipment. Um, the way we normally would track uh, during those sessions was uh, I would go in the room and just Jimmy and I, because it was my responsibility to get good t drum takes out of Jimmy. 
Uh, the drums were uh, were set up in the room, kind of in the middle of the room for maximum volume, probably the loudest drum room I've ever been in. It was so loud in there I'd have to wear um, ear protection inside my ears and then put headphones at the top, and it was still too loud. It was absolutely deafening in there, which is why you hear such a great a drum sound. Uh, Butch had come up with this contraption. I'm going to try to sort of demonstrate it. But if this is the end of a kick drum, they had built this like about four or five foot long a plexiglass funnel. It had a little hole in it so they could put a mic to close mic the drum on the inside. Um, and then at the very end, four or five feet out, was another microphone to get a deeper resonant kick. Uh, incredible drum sound that Butch got. Butch being a drummer, always got great drum sounds. And uh, standard, standard, pretty, uh, pretty standard gear. A uh, soul head, uh, which anybody would recognize from the uh, from the uh, uh, probably the Shiva video, um, which I still have. Uh, standard Marshall four by ten cabinet, uh, SVT uh, base stack. Uh, actually, no, sorry, on Gish we used a whatever was uh, Jane's Addiction had the, the they were green and so, I'm sorry I should be more prepared. <laughs> I know the tech people will be all over me. Uh, it was card key maybe it was like so, it was a very popular time you couldn't really turn it up it was solid state so if you turned it up too light it make this horrible distortion but that's kind of get, how you get that the clean sound um and we we got that amp because we saw jane's addiction when we played with them in 1988 we saw them using that amp so we thought that was the amp to get um not a great amp but uh good for recording and um yeah so so generally speaking on a song like i am one jimmy and i would go in the room uh, get get a take on the drums. I can't remember how many takes we did IM1, but probably wouldn't have been a lot. Probably three, four, five takes at the most. Uh, at that point, we weren't really cutting tape. So whatever was the drum take that we would do, then uh, we'd get a good bass sound. Uh, I tracked the bass, put the guitars, rhythm guitars on, and then uh, and then the soloing. Um, for for the guitar rig, we had a, um, a J ADA MP1, which I think I sold on the, when I did the reverb sale. I sold those. Uh, quadriverb, which added a little bit of gain and effects when I needed it, and that's it. I mean, we had literally almost no gear, and the gear we had was half falling apart, uh, except for James' guitar, which was new, uh, which he still has. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think of what else I can add on IM1. Again, I think it's very curious that we didn't really spend any time uh, with the pressure that was on us. I don't think it really occurred to us, um, but looking back now, it's, it's a strange decision.